Hi everyone, welcome to the Ashley Barlow Company podcast. I'm Ashley Barlow, your host. If you are a parent, a teacher or someone who works at a school, or you're a community member, a volunteer or a staff member at an organization that supports people with special education plans, a coach, a tutor, or even a grandparent, you're in the right place. Sit back with an ice cold glass of lemonade, put on your walking shoes and grab some headphones, roll down the windows and cruise. Ready, set, go. Educate, advocate, collaborate. Welcome back to another episode of Special Education Advocacy with Ashley Barlow. I'm Ashley Barlow, and I'm so happy you're here. And I'm so happy I'm here. I just got back from a two-week vacation. Holy cow. You are in my basement because the second and first floors of my house are destroyed with unpacked suitcases and just laundry, you name it, it is everywhere. So here we are. We had a wonderful spring break and that was preceded by a week-long swim meet for Griffin in Tampa. And now it is IEP season. So in today's episode, I am going to talk to you about something I cannot believe I haven't talked about before on the podcast. In fact, before I wrote my notes for this episode, I double checked and triple checked that I hadn't talked about this before because I can't believe I haven't talked about this. Like if there is one thing that I recommend you do before your IEP meeting, it is this. And so I don't know why. I don't know why it's been so long. I'm sorry that I haven't talked to you about this, but here we go. Before we dive in today's episode, I do want to remind you that the ABC course is opening for enrollment on April 15th, 2022. We are making tax day fun here at Ashley Barlow Company, and we are opening the ABC course for enrollment on April 15th. So if you have thought about becoming a special education advocate, or if you are an advocate and want to become a better advocate, you're looking for more training, and you're looking for a community of other similarly trained and similarly minded advocates, I invite you to check out the course. Everything will be live on the website on Friday, April 15th, 2022, and we would love to have you. I have gotten a couple of emails, um, more than a couple, but some emails from um, some of you, uh, my listeners that have said, I'm interested in the course, I want to know more about it. So if you have any questions, if you um, would like to join us, but have some hesitations or need some information, just shoot me an email and I will be happy to respond. If you don't have my email address, it's Ashley at Ashley Barlow Co, C-O, like company, dot com. Okay, so exciting stuff going on here. And one of the exciting things is IEP season. Now, you know, what's kind of funny is when we um, got to go to this swim meet, I was like, oh, cool, two weeks. Um, it backs right up to spring break, so two weeks out of the office. I've never been out of the office for two weeks. And I was just thinking about tax season and a couple of cases that I had that were wrapping up and this project that I had and a trial that I've got coming up in like late spring, early summer. And then I don't know why, but like two weeks later, I thought, holy cow, how am I going to be gone for two weeks during IEP season? It is nuts in my office in March, April, May, and the beginning of June. But we may do, we managed, I took a lot of file reviews with me, um, and we made do. So today, we are going to talk about one of my favorite ways to succeed in an IEP meeting. And what I'm talking about is the future planning statement or the parent interest statement. Now, if you live in a state where there isn't a place in the IEP document for parent interest or for parents comments or for a future planning statement or something like that don't tune out in kentucky um there is a spot but it isn't always tapped into um and i have literally never had a family that has been asked for information for that section ever in um, kentucky and ohio there is which is great 
I'm extra fidgety today. So if you're watching on Facebook, I'm sorry. I'm kind of in uncomfortable jeans. And you know, when I'm in my basement, I sit on the floor. Anyway, um, so that's okay if that doesn't exist because really kind of the purpose of this, like the, the functional purpose is for parents to give their interests to like say what they want to say before the meeting and to talk about the child's future. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the mechanics, but like a really strong advocacy undercurrent to just having this document is being like, Hey, anybody want to hear from me? Hey, I'm around. Hey, I'm the parent. I'm a part of this IEP team and I have something to say and everybody should value what I have to say. So if your state's documents or your district's documents or the documents that you're familiar with don't include something like this, that is all the more reason to be like, hey, listen, I prepared a, whatever you wanna call it, an interest statement or a pre-IEP letter. Um, and I'd like for it to become a record, a part of the record from um, this meeting. And what that does is that has the team then understand that you are a parent or you are a person filling that parent's role. And let's just go ahead and say, if you attend an IEP meeting and you are not a parent, but you're a grandparent or you're a guardian or you are an advocate for a child that doesn't have a parent there, then we're gonna call all of you parents for just the simplicity of today's meeting or today's podcast. So um, you're saying, I want to collaborate. I have things to say from my perspective. I have reviewed the draft IEP. I observe things at home. I facilitate things in the community. I talk to all the outside therapists and tutors and, and people in the community, the neighbors and all of these people. And I think that that's valuable and, and could really add to this meeting. And if you do it in a tactful enough way, it will be valued from the very beginning. Um, and if it isn't tactful, it still can be very valuable. And over time, that value will start to come. You will start to become valued. As I said um, in a recent podcast, change takes time. Um, and so I don't think that we can expect that we're just gonna you know, hit them with a parent interest statement and everybody's gonna say, oh, hallelujah, you know, you're the kind of parent that we need to really pay attention to. But these little things help us to chip away at that um, kind of ostracized feeling that parents get in meetings when parents kind of feel like they're on the outside. So that is the undertone, the undercurrent to the reason why I recommend writing a parent interest statement. Now, the parent interest statement, um, from my perspective, what I like to tell my clients to do is, is kind of to do two different things. Let's talk about the future planning statement first. Okay, so the purpose of IDEA. You could say it with me if you have listened for a while because I always come back to the purpose of the law. One of the articulated purposes of the law is to prepare the child for, for further education, employment, and independent living. And even if we don't think about education, which we should, because we should be talking about post-secondary education, right? Like it might just be making a child, not just be, it might be making the child a lifelong learner, but we might be talking about a trade school or a college experience or some other kind of educational experience. Um, so, that's education. But when we talk about independent living and we talk about employment, we are really talking about skills that the parent might have to be the general contractor of. The parent might have to be the person that is organizing these things. Now, I have children um, in my practice that have specific learning disabilities. And I am always so, um, grateful to the parents that say to me, you know, Ashley, if I told you how much I had to do in order to facilitate their job at the fast food restaurant on the corner, or um, how much I have to communicate with the soccer coach in order to make sure that my daughter is at practice on time and has all of the equipment and knows when there's a change and all of that thing, all of that stuff because of their executive functioning. 
You are the general contractors of so much in your children's lives, and a lot of times that is secondary to their diagnoses. Maybe it's their executive functioning, maybe it's their ability to stay on task, maybe it's um, you know their their cognitive ability. Whatever it is, you are probably doing things that you don't even realize that you're doing. And when you don't have high school, when we're talking about the future, when we don't have those people that are helping us to kind of plan these things and to organize these things, then we as parents become the general contractor of those things. And so when we talk about education, independent living and employment, we're really kind of talking about parents at least facilitating the conversations and, and being the, the, as I like to say, the general contractors. And so it makes sense then that you're going to be talking about your hopes and dreams for the child into the future. Now, I always like to stop when I talk to my clients and say, okay, so like, obviously the child's at the center of this. And so we need to know what the child wants to do by way of all of these things as well. So it's important that you have conversations with your child, that you get your child properly evaluated once they become transition age and all of those things so that we really know a lot about the child. But this is a parent interest statement. You as the parent are part of the IEP team and your input matters. Remember the word parent, is in idea over 450 times. Congress wanted you and your input at the IEP table. And so the future planning part, what I like to tell people to do is to focus on five areas of adult life. So I like for people to say, these are my hopes and dreams for my child as it relates to employment, independent living, transportation, health, and, oh gosh, I hate it when this happens. Um, employment, independent living, transportation, independent living, oh, and education, hello, and their education. So this is where I want for my child to be as it applies to all of those things. This is what, you know, let's talk about employment. I think my child would do really well in this kind of setting, or I think that my child will need this kind of support, or my child only says that they went, to, I can't tell you how many students I have that say they went to work at the GameStop, which is like, a, I think they sell video games and like um, recycled video games, like a used bookstore for video games. I think that's what it is. Um, so many of my boys that are transition age in my practice say they want to work at GameStop. But I, you know, and then pa parent might say, you know, the only thing they ever say is that they want to work at GameStop, but I think there's this program that they could do and, and that they could really benefit from this program. And I actually don't think retail is a good fit for these reasons. You know, let's talk about their social skills. So we talk about the medical part. Let's also talk about their social skills and what kind of social skills they need to build where we're gonna capitalize, how you're going to keep them socially active, how you're going to keep them involved in their community. Let's talk about their ability to advocate for themselves medically, whether or not you're considering, considering guardianship and kind of where you are in that discussion. Um, and I'm talking about when your child is in preschool and kindergarten. Now I know that that is hard to kind of think about, but I'm sitting here in my basement and we finished our basement, I don't know, four or five years ago when Jack was in like kindergarten or first grade. And when we refinished our basement, we actually built this room that he's in now to be something that could be a bedroom for him. Because when I think about Jack's future, I think that right now in 2022 and whenever we did this basement, I have not seen a whole lot of independent living options in our area that seem like they would be as inclusive, quite frankly, as if Jack lived in an apartment in our basement. I have not found anything that I think would work for our family and make the most sense for our family as it as 
just living in our basement in an apartment, I truly think that we can set up a super inclusive environment for him here and that he can live healthfully and independently here. And so when we did this basement, we made this room, it's got a full bathroom in it and it's got ingress and egress. So it actually counts as a bedroom, which is nice. And then um, when we set up, it's got, this basement has a bar and what we did was we made spots in the bar so that it can be a bar now. And if Jack wants to live independently here, then it can become a kitchen. So there is a cabinet that is the same size as a dishwasher. It's a little bit bigger than a normal cabinet. And there is a spot um, that right now houses like a bar kind of refrigerator, but it actually is big enough to house a full size refrigerator so that he can have a full kitchen down here if that is the right choice when he ages. And so you might not even realize that you think about your child's future when your child is in preschool and kindergarten, but you are. And so if you sit down and you think about those five areas of adult life now, and you write them down, and then you figure out how you can kind of communicate what your thoughts are, that's your first paragraph. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna back that down and in your second paragraph, you're gonna talk about those five areas of life, but you're gonna back it down to high school. So you're going to say, you know, I really, so one of our hopes and dreams for Jack um, is in our future planning statement is my husband's a golfer. And so he would like to play 18 holes of golf with his two boys at Pinehurst, which is a golf resort in North Carolina. And he wants to have a beer with his boys on the um, one specific deck that overlooks a hole um, at Pinehurst. And so we talk about that in our future, in our first paragraph, right? Like that's a social goal for Jack. And that's a very specific one, but it's very important. And what you learn, what the teachers learn is that playing golf at a Southern golf resort is way different than if we said, um, you know, that we really don't have any social goals for Jack or that we expect that Jack um, will be, I don't know, a, um, a greeter at a Walmart in New York City. That's a totally different goal and that's not a social goal. I didn't have that part brainstorm, so that's a bad example. But knowing that that is the kind of environment that we would like for him to be in at least once a year or at least once in his lifetime gives the school team a, a kind of nice background, right? And when you plug in all of these little hopes and dreams for the parents, it helps them understand, okay, these are the kind of people that will want their child to know this, or these are the kind of people that will want their child to be able to have these skills or to be able to do this to be able to be in this environment, to be able to have these employment goals, to be able to achieve this kind of independence medically or from a travel perspective. Are we working on a driver's license or are we not? And if we are working on a driver's license, that's in paragraph one. So now we're in the high school paragraph. What skills do we need to have when we are 14 and 15 and 16 in order to work towards that driver's license? What do we need to learn in order to work towards that driver's license? Because this is a goal of idea. A goal of idea is to prepare us for independent living. Transportation's a part of that. So do we need to have goals in high school that help us work towards these social things, these medical things, these self-advocacy skills, these pre-employment skills? All of that matters. Then you take it and you back it down to wherever you are. If you're in middle school or you're in grade school or even in preschool, you might have to take a couple of stops if you're in preschool. So this is what this looks like in elementary school. And this is what it looks like this year. So I'm gonna back it all the way down. One of our goals for Jack socially is Jack has wonderful, wonderful friends. If you go back in my social media feeds, you'll see um, that we recently celebrated inclusion at our school board meeting. And we had, I don't even know how many kids, but we probably had a total of 25 people that stood behind us as we um, spoke with our school board because he has just had wonderful educators and wonderful friends throughout elementary school. 
And I um, learned this phrase from a client. I had a client say that they wanted their child to be interested and interesting because they really thought that that was the key to maintaining the social relationships that their child had developed in grade school. And I thought about Jack's kind of core group of, I don't know, six or eight buddies. And I thought, yeah, that's true. Because they're all interested in stuff, you know, like it was Pokemon cards for a little while. And now it's Major League Baseball and the NBA. And and they're interested in, in fashion, as terrible as their fashion is. <laughs> and they're interested in stuff. And Jack has to stay interested in that. Because if he isn't interested in those things, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, Jack, we're talking about soccer. You don't care. Yeah, yeah, Jack, we're talking about basketball. You don't care. So you have to stay interested. That lifelong learning piece is a super important piece to maintaining social relationships for a lot of people. And then the other piece is interesting. And I thought about the interesting piece um, when my client said this, and I thought about myself actually. So I was injured when I was a child and I've had a lot of life's experiences. My husband's had cancer, of course we have Jack. Um, and you know, I thought that's so true because I have friends, especially when we were younger, especially when I was um, 16, 17 and I was in chronic pain and I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And you know, I had friends that, were, that hadn't really had a whole lot of experiences and I was like, I have nothing in common with them. I can't really connect because their lives seem so um, so simple, so straightforward. And, and I just don't like, I don't think that we see um, things, we don't see eye to eye anymore. We don't see things the same and it's hard to connect. And so, you know, I kind of applied that to Jack when my client said that and I thought, you know, so this is really true because Jack's friends are going to get married and they're going to um, get fired from jobs and they're gonna have infertility issues and they're gonna have babies and they're gonna have these like real life issues. And if Jack is living in my basement and working at a small business and um, getting dropped off by his parents at work every day, he isn't gonna have a whole lot of opportunity to stay interesting. He isn't gonna have a whole lot of opportunity to fail, to have those life um, changing, those perspective changing experiences. And so, you know, I went back to my client after she said this and I said, I think you have impacted me so significantly um, because I think you, you helped me to loosen the rubber band, right? You helped me to really kind of reframe the way I have been thinking about adulthood because staying interesting and staying interested really is a key to social interaction. And so what's that mean then for high school? What it means for high school is continuing to have experiences, in, in, in my case, that really kind of push Jack, continuing to, to face hardships, and continuing to put himself in a situation where he remains with these kids or with some group of kids that have similar experiences. And so specifically what he does, these little boys play basketball together. They aren't little boys anymore, but they play basketball together. And so he's the manager for their basketball team. And what that could look like in middle school and in high school is maybe he is the manager for a basketball team. And if he isn't the manager, because that's going to be a sensory challenge for him, somehow we want for him to be involved with that group of kids that's playing basketball together because we want him to maintain that social relationship. And then we want him to continue to be exposed to experiences that make him interested and interesting so that those kids continue to be fulfilled by the relationship with Jack, just as Jack is fulfilled with the relationship with them. And that is a super, super important thing to us. And then we back that down to elementary school. Well, in elementary school, maybe it means always having a buddy in his class. Maybe that's something that we can ask for. And, and maybe it means that he continues to play in the basketball league that's sponsored by the elementary school because that's really where these relationships developed. You know, so we back it down. We talk about it from um, high school and we back it down to middle school and we back it down to the right now. What's that mean right now? 
And then you get to the parent interest part because now you're at the right now. So it's kind of this really nice place to then talk about the right now. So maybe you're looking at the draft of the IEP and you're giving your feedback and there's something that you want to write a paragraph about. Well, you write it. Maybe there's something that's kind of been like bugging you or something that you want to change. So you put it in there. Maybe it's something that you want to just be able to give your interests. You know, they know your position. They know that you want this, that you want X, that you want why that you want the the whatever but they don't know why you want it so maybe now is the time to kind of tie it in even to the future planning statement and to say you know that we are strong proponents of inclusion and we are prepared to have a very robust discussion about inclusion at our upcoming iep meeting we thought we would take this opportunity to share a few of the reasons why we believe that such and such placement is correct for our child. And you really kind of dive into the why. This way, you have it documented. And you also have the opportunity to say it in an organized, well thought out, well founded basis. And your emotions aren't coming into it because you have time to write. You have time to sit down and think about what you want to say, and just as importantly, how you want to say it. And if it comes after kind of the future planning part, you can pretty much easily weave it into the future planning part of it, which can be very, very helpful in a nuanced way. You might sneak it in there and they won't know what hit them. So I highly, highly, highly recommend that you write a future planning statement and that you include parent interests or something of that sort and that you submit it to your IEP team before the meeting. Now, I like to give 48 hours before the meeting um, just so that the school has an opportunity to review what we have said. If they don't get me a draft until about 48 hours before, sometimes I'll go ahead and send it before um, the draft comes and I say, you know, I'll probably have some edits to this um, once we have the draft. And sometimes I just send it, you know, four or five hours before the meeting because I haven't had a chance to review what they've sent and then review what my client's written for the future planning statement and then get it over to them. Um, and so there's kind of no, no right answer as to when to send it, but I would say as soon as possible because you want for them to have ample opportunity to look at it before the meeting. I hope that is helpful for you. Be sure to check out the ABC course, which opens for enrollment this Friday, April 15th, 2022. We would love to have you in our ABC community, and I will see you next week, same time, same place.